so um everyone <coughs> welcome to this uh uh astronomy club zoom meeting uh my name is uh peter household i'm a uh, chair of Corp Astronomy Club. So this is Julian Onions, everyone. Hello, everyone. And Julian is a uh, postdoctoral researcher at Nottingham University. Uh, his speciality is uh, is simulations. So he um, simulates the way the universe works. And if his simulation actually mirrors what really happens out there, then that proves he's he's made the right assumptions, and if his simulation is catastrophically unlike any universe that ever existed, that proves he's got something wrong, and that that that's what Julian does for a living. But anyway, tonight he's very kindly uh, agreed to talk to us about galaxies, one gig year at a time. So without further ado, Julian, you're very welcome, and we're very grateful to you for making the time, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Peter. I'm very glad to be here. Um, I did visit Cork about two years ago. I was on a cruise and called it at Cork, so I could have met you all in person if I'd known. <laughs> so uh, talk is about galaxies and one gig a year at a time. So galaxies is a particularly popular subject at Nottingham because that's all the astronomy department um, study. We don't study stars, we don't study planets, we don't study um, novas or anything like that. We just look at galaxies. So um, everybody uh, um, in the department works on galaxies of one form or another. And uh, one gig a year, so that's about a billion years. Well, it's exactly a billion years. That is about the time anything interesting happens within a galaxy. So you have to wait around for about a gig a year to sort of see what's going on. Uh, on this screen that uh, we've actually spelt out galaxies across the top in galaxies and my name also along the bottom. So uh, let's get into it then. Uh, so just in case um, anybody's come here with the wrong uh, wrong idea, uh, it's not going to be about chocolate. So I'm sorry to disappoint you about that. Uh, it's also not going to be about mobile phones if you've got a galaxy mobile phone because uh, they seem to be getting ever bigger. What it will be about is things that happened a long time ago and far, far away, but not in quite uh, the Hollywood style. So, uh, you know, there will be, uh, be a few references to uh, Star Wars, but not uh, too much. So this is what it's about, is uh, the galaxies. And these aren't really the ones we study because they're too nearby and too uh, sort of beautiful. They've all been uh, looked at before by other people. So uh, we tend to go for the more distant ones that are still uh, waiting uh, more close examination. The other thing to note is how deep this goes. So this is a picture of the night sky taken by uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, it was an 11 day exposure and uh, they focused in on this section and practically everything in that picture is a galaxy. It's a couple of stars here and there, the ones with diffraction spikes, but everything else is a galaxy. So there are galaxies all the way to the very edge of the universe that we can see. Um, this is a bit of light relief. So uh, uh, you, you can practice this over the Christmas holidays. Now, just to get you sort of um, oriented, let's talk about some distances. So the first distance that astronomers use is called the astronomical unit, and that's the distance between the Earth and the Sun, about 93 million miles, 150 million kilometers, depending on uh, where you sit. So that's really not useful for us with galaxies. It's far too small. It's very useful for moving around the solar system, but not very much uh, use beyond that because it's just, just too tiny. The next one up is the light year or the parsec. Now this begins to get slightly more useful. So it's about four light years to the nearest star, Alpha Centauri, or 1.3 parsecs. Um, light years are kind of more intuitive, but parsecs is what um, astronomers use. So we, we get uh, very used to talking parsecs and uh, actually you sort of divide it by three in your head, you get to sort of light years to parsecs. So when we talk about parsecs, roughly one parsec is the distance between stars. So that tells you uh, quite how far apart things are, but it doesn't really give you any sense of scale. And the next 
picture is, uh, I'm afraid it's Nottingham centric, but um, anyway, there we go. This is a picture sort of centered on Nottingham. And this would be, if we shrunk the sun, which is huge, many, many times the width of the earth, if we shrunk that down to about the size of a marble, about half an inch across, and put it in the center of Nottingham, the next star, that we would come across, Alpha Centauri or um, any of the others, would be at least on this uh, radius of the uh, the circle. So from Nottingham, I would have to travel to Dover and beyond, or nearly to Scotland, to get to the next marble. So you can see how the galaxy is mostly empty space. You, know, you think of these marbles and then hundreds and hundreds of miles before you come to the next marble. Luckily, they're all lit up, the stars, so we can see them. So that gives you a sense of sort of within the galaxy. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about uh, what is a galaxy. So it's a big collection of stars all bound together with gravity. And uh, there is typically somewhere between, well, on a, a galaxy like ours, 100 to 400 billion stars. So that's a lot of stars. Um, and most of them have got planets as well. So there's a lot of, lot of expansion room in the galaxy. Another way of describing a galaxy, it's a machine for turning cold hydrogen into new stars. So it's a, a way of manufacturing stars. Now this is uh, going way back. This is what Herschel's view of um, a galaxy was. He tried to map out the Milky Way uh, by just counting how many stars he could see in various directions. And this is his best picture of the Milky Way uh, that he could see at the time. He was rather limited in that he didn't quite understand as much as we do today. Uh, it's a very good picture for the time, but uh, he didn't realize there was a lot of dust and um, other components within our galaxy that stop you seeing very far. So you can see out to uh, some of these places. Let me just uh, turn on the laser pointer there. So you can see out here, this is not where the stars end. The stars actually keep going for many, many uh, times the, the width of the screen but there would be a big dust cloud here that would stop him seeing any further. So we've, we've got techniques now to look through those dust clouds and see a bit further. And this is the best idea of what our galaxy looks like. So here's the sun out here in this uh, yellow circle, uh, about halfway out from the center of the galaxy. It's not even in a very interesting point. Uh, these are the spiral arms of the galaxy. We're not even in one of those. So we're just sort of drifting around uh, um, in a sort of idle backwater, really. But it's quite difficult to make a map of the uh, galaxy based on uh, what we know, because uh, it's, it's very difficult to, you know, if you're sitting in the middle of a city to actually draw the full city because you can't see quite a lot of it. So uh, this is, but this is the best effort we've got. And if you go back to sizes, it's about 100,000 light years across or about 30 kiloparsecs. So that means if you could set off from this side of the galaxy at the speed of light, which is far faster than any of our rockets can go by many times, it would take you 100,000 years to get from one side of the galaxy to the other. And that's the fastest speed that we're allowed to go according to physics at the moment. But for a long time, nobody quite knew what a galaxy was, because if you take this picture, um, this is the Perseus cluster of galaxies, all these uh, fuzzy things here are galaxies. Uh, uh, probably not that big. Uh, but you can see lots and lots of stars there and galaxies scattered amongst them. So you know, there was a discussion for quite a while. Are these things just part of the Milky Way or are they you know, outside the Milky Way? unless you can measure the distance to them and say, well, these things are nearer than those things, it's very difficult to, to tell. Uh, here's, here's another one, the Fornax cluster. Again, a group of galaxies scattered amongst the stars. So you know, we now know that uh, these things are much further away than uh, the stars we can see. And indeed it was um, Edwin Hubble with using this very large telescope, this, the 100 inch uh, telescope that managed to work this out. He looked at the nearest galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy, one we'll look at very shortly, and was able to make out enough detail with it, with this powerful telescope, to work out exactly how far away it was. Well, when I say exactly, he, he got it wrong by about a factor of four or so, but uh, it didn't really matter because it was so far outside 
the furthest star of our galaxy, that it was clearly something separate. So he started, uh, he, he now knew that these galaxies were something separate from the Milky Way. And whenever you make a scientific discovery like this, you have to think what you're going to do. What are you going to do next? How do you proceed? And taking a quote from uh, Ernest Rutherford, that all science is either physics or stamp collecting, you can start to try and make sense of this. Galaxy morphology just means what they look like. So um, Ernest Rutherford's idea of stamp collecting was if, if you don't quite know what you're doing, why not just make categories of things and see if there's, you know, you can make sense of these categories. Is there some commonality between the categories? It works very well for the biologists. You know, they made these categories of things that, you know, things that fly were called birds, things with six legs were insects, things that swam in the sea were fishes and so on. So you, you could, you can sort of make these stamp collecting categories of these things. And then eventually when they looked in more detail at each of these, they saw some commonality between them. You know, the amphibian skeleton is very similar to a reptile skeleton. So maybe there was uh, some uh, bigger picture here to discover. So can you do the same with galaxies? There's quite a lot of galaxies. In fact, one of my colleagues um, about three years ago published a paper saying uh, he'd worked out there were about two trillion galaxies in the visible universe. So there's even more galaxies than there are stars in our own galaxy. So, you know, if we ever fill up our own galaxy, we've got another two trillion to explore, each with billions of stars. There's a lot of room out there room for everybody to have a, well, everybody on the earth to have several galaxies of their own, if you wish. So this is um, the first categorization of galaxies that was attempted. This was indeed Edwin Hubble's categorization, and he came up with four categories. And these are his four categories. So he came up with these, this grouping here. He said, these are um, spiral galaxies because they seem to be sort of spiraling around um, the stars seem to be spiraling around the center. Uh, then we have this group, which is the elliptical galaxies, because they're sort of amorphous and more blobby shaped. And these are the two main types of galaxy. So, you know, about 90% of the galaxies are either spiral or elliptical. And uh, the other two, which uh, I'll, I'll come back to uh, in somewhat, this is um, the lenticular galaxies. And these are the irregular galaxies. So like any good scientist, he had a sort of bucket that he kept below his desk that he could put into anything that didn't really quite fit into uh, one of these nice clean categories. And he came up with this uh, thing called the classification, which uh, was called the tuning fork diagram because it looks a bit like a tuning fork. Not that I think uh, many musicians use tuning forks these days. I think they all use uh, digital tuning pretty much. But uh, anyway, in those days, tuning fork was it. And we had the elliptical galaxies along the sort of handle of the tuning fork. We have the lenticular galaxies here, which I said I'll come back to. And then we have two branches of spirals. We have those with bars across the middle like these, uh, which you perhaps see a little better in these uh, sort of cartoony pictures, and those without spirals. So uh, an S with a capital B next to it is a barred spiral. And then the letter little letter a b or c says how tightly wound it is so an a is quite loosely wound and a c is quite tightly wound and the same if you have it without the bar you just miss out the capital b so s a b c and there is even uh, these days an sd type which is a very sort of amorphous galaxy going back to the ellipticals they get a number after them which just says how elliptical they are so an e naught is like looks like a perfect circle almost and an E7 is very stretched. Uh, and there, there is actually a, a mathematical way of working out exactly what number uh, that should be, but uh, that's good enough for now. So with that, uh, you know, this is what we teach all our second years in, uh, in the, their degree course. They have to be able to trot out this uh, picture at, uh, on command. So with that, we can look at some galaxies. And if we start with uh, spiral galaxies, because they're the most interesting and most sort of beautiful. This is our nearest neighbor, the Andromeda Galaxy. I'm sure quite a lot of your members have seen this. Uh, it's um, about two billion light years away. So uh, it's 
allegedly the furthest thing you can see with a naked eye. And some of you may have seen it with your naked eye. I've tried and never managed it. I think maybe my eyesight is uh, against me nowadays. Uh, you need a very dark sky, of course, to see that. Uh, and it is really quite large. Uh, you, here it is next to uh, uh, the full moon or what, how, how big the full moon would. So you can see it's bigger in width than the full moon. But unfortunately, whenever you train uh, even a, a fairly large telescope on it, really all you see is something like this. You see the very core of the galaxy. You don't see all that structure stretching out because that's uh, very dim and needs uh, really um, a, a camera to, to capture that. So that's the Andromeda galaxy, the one Hubble looked at in great detail. And we can look at it in enough detail now to pick out individual stars and uh, individual events in it. So it's, it's a very handy uh, reference. This is a, a sideways on galaxy. This is another spiral galaxy called the Sombrero galaxy. And this one, you can see how thin it is compared to its width. So galaxy, spiral galaxies are really very thin. Most of the action is in a sort of a, a disk that um, really is uh, quite thin compared to its width. Uh, but uh, you can also see here large amounts of this black stuff. This is dust that is generated by stars. Uh, it's not really like dust that's uh, floating around your house or at least floating around my house. Uh, it's more like the consistency of smoke. So it's little particles of um, sort of uh, carbon and silicates that are drifting around, but they soak up light. So uh, they, they, they stop you seeing beyond them, at least in visible wavelength. Uh, this is a, uh, something a little more close to the Milky Way. This is a, uh, a barred galaxy. This is actually called NGC 1300. And uh, this one, you can see some details. You can clearly see this big bar across the center that uh, is, is quite prominent. And you can see the spiral arms that give it its name. Um, the other thing you may notice uh, if you're observant is that it's very blue in the spiral arms, sort of bluey purpley color along here, and more sort of reddy orange in the center. And that is a, a good observation if you did notice that, and um, one that uh, will give us our first clue about what is happening in uh, these galaxies in a couple of slides time. But firstly, a couple more ways to understand them. A fried egg is also a very good model of a, a spiral galaxy. We have this uh, big bulbous bit in the center and then the very thin disk of stars going outwards. And if you still use them, a DVD or a CD is also a very good analog. So if you happen to have a CD, it, it is about the same dimensions. The width to the, uh, to the thickness is very similar. So again, a spiral galaxy is very thin uh, you know, all the stars are, are packed into this bit uh, with, a, with not a lot of uh, depth to it, but quite a lot of width. And if we want to talk about the galaxy, then these are the usual components. Often it has this bulge in the center, which uh, is, is quite sort of bulbous and, and round. But the rest of it, as I said, is a very flat disk. So this is, this is called the disk. And then we have this sort of halo effect where other things live. There are a few stars living in this halo, a few uh, globular clusters, and a few other bits and pieces. But most of the galaxy is really in this disk and the bulge. So that's really where most of it's happening. The other big component of a galaxy is one you don't see, uh, which is the dark matter structure of it. So dark matter, we don't know what it is. I have a whole talk on that one, uh, uh, if you really do want to know. Uh, but it encompasses the, the galaxy uh, in something that's about 10 times as, uh, as large as the galaxy itself. So this big dark matter structure is actually most of the gravity of the uh, uh, galaxy. This is kind of what holds it together largely. Uh, here's another image. This is in uh, infrared, I think, of M81. You can see again this uh, quite bright core and then these long spiral arms coming out. Uh, and uh, over Christmas, you can have a go at making your own uh, spiral galaxy uh, if you get uh, some chocolates. This is uh, another spiral galaxy with lots of arms to this one, uh, probably five or six. And this is sometimes called a flocculent spiral, sort of woolly spiral, something like that. Something with lots and lots of um, structure to it. 
not much of a bar. But again, you can see it's kind of reddish in the center and very blue towards the outside. So why is that? Uh, so you need to know a little bit about uh, stellar evolution for that, which is life and death of stars. So if we look at our sun uh, nearby, it's uh, the temperature on the surface is about 6,000 degrees, uh, um, 5,800 Kelvin or 6,000 degrees centigrade. And it weighs one solar mass because uh, we like to keep things simple. So we've, we've said, you know, the sun is one solar mass and then we can measure other things. Are they bigger or smaller than uh, the sun? And it looks quite yellow or, or white uh, when you look at it. Uh, obviously don't look at it with, um, without a uh, filter, but uh, it's that sort of color. Now, it's a sort of fairly common size for a star, but uh, you know, it's by no means uh, all stars are, are this size. We get other stars like a red dwarf, which are about half to um, less than that. Uh, in terms of the mass, so about half, half the mass of the sun. And they don't get nearly as hot. So this is three and a half thousand degrees, and it tends to glow in a quite a red color. And this is very much like uh, if you've ever seen metal heated up at a blacksmith's, you know, it starts off as a, a black piece of metal, but as it gradually gets hotter in the fire, it starts to glow red. And if you get it hotter still, it goes to a sort of a orangey yellow. And this is just the progression. As things get hotter, they tend to give off more uh, you know, when, when they're cooler, they give off more in the red. When they're hotter, they give off more in the blue. So this is a, a red dwarf, our own sun. And then we have uh, some of the giants, such as Rigel in um, Orion. This is a blue giant. Uh, Rigel isn't quite as big as this. This is uh, an example at 30 solar masses, so 30 times uh, the uh, mass of the sun. These burn ferociously fast. And uh, this would be a 30,000 degree surface temperature. So this gives off most of its light in the blue. It still gives off yellow and red and other colors, but nearly all of it is in the blue, most of it. So they look very blue in color. So that gives us a little clue about what's going on in these galaxies. The other thing you need to know is how long they last. So this is in giga years or billions of years. So our sun lasts about 10 billion years. We're about halfway through. So we've five billion years of burning so far, and another five billion years to go. Uh, these red dwarfs, they burn very, very slowly. So they would last for a hundred billion years. And uh, as the universe is only this old, about 13.8 billion years, you can see any red dwarf that's been born in the universe is still chugging along merrily. Whereas you know, if the sun was born right at the start of the universe, it would have gone out by now. But look at the blue giant how quickly that gets through its fuel. Uh, 15 to 30 million years. I mean, obviously it sounds like a long time. It's more than enough time for you and me. But, you know, it's 65 million years ago, the dinosaurs were roaming the earth and you could have had two of these blue giants born, lived and died in that time. So they have a very, very short lifespan. Uh, they're very much considered the rock stars, you know, live fast, die young. That's the, uh, the motto for blue giants. So going back to galaxies, uh, this is what's giving all this blue color. This must be the blue giants that are uh, in these spiral arms. But how can that be if blue giants only last a few million years? This galaxy is billions of years old. Uh, the only explanation must be that there's a good turnover of stars. There are new stars being born. So uh, in galaxies like um, the Milky Way and probably this one here, uh, they, they have a reasonable turnover of stars. They, a new star is born about once a year on average. I mean, it's, it's not that simple because it takes actually millions of years for a star to form and it gets slowly hotter and hotter. But if you, if you average it out, it's about one new star a year. So there's lots of new stars being formed here. Where new stars are made, you get lots of sun-like stars, you get lots and lots of red dwarfs, and you get a few of these blue giants just occasionally come along, but because they're so bright and so luminous, they just outshine everything else. So that's why it looks blue there. And you can see that again in this one uh, picture of the Whirlpool galaxy. Uh, again, a nice center to it and these long uh, spiral arms with uh, a lot of blue stars being formed in them. 
And the other useful thing to know about a spiral galaxy is uh, they are a lot more sort of uh, controlled and structured. All the stars are by and large going around in the same direction. They're all following each other, going around uh, slowly around the center, but uh, in a nice progression. So it takes, uh, you know, the, in the Milky Way, 250 million years or so to go once around uh, the center. So, you know, when we were last in this point in space in the galaxy, stuff was just about crawling out of the sea onto the land for the first time. And who knows what will have happened when we get back here in 250 million years. I'm hoping coronavirus will be over by then. Now, if we look at the other type of galaxy, these are much less beautiful, I have to say. They are much more blobby. Um, so these are the elliptical galaxies. They tend to be more common slightly than spiral galaxies. And they tend to be bigger as well, have more stars in them. Uh, and the other thing I, to notice about them is they're very chaotic. The stars are not going around in an orderly way. They're going around the center, but in all sorts of directions. So there isn't really any, you, you can't say everything is going around clockwise or anti-clockwise. They're just doing whatever they feel like. So uh, they're a much more chaotic environment. Uh, this is a uh, Messier 59. Also known as uh, NGC 4621. Um, this is a, uh, uh, an E5, so it's quite a stretched out, blobby um, elliptical galaxy. Oh, the other thing to say about elliptical galaxies, whereas spirals are very thin, like the compact disk, these are much more three dimensional. So when I say an elliptical galaxy, you should think more of a rugby ball than a, uh, than a flat ellipse or a football for the uh, very circular ones. So this is a very circular one. Uh, F89 and E0, very, very circular or spherical, really, because it's it has three dimensions to it. And this is an E7, very stretched out galaxy, looking uh, sort of uh, like a stretch rugby ball or a cigar or something like that. And you can see there's another galaxy over here, which is probably uh, doing the stretching for it. So those are elliptical galaxies. There's not a huge amount to say about those because, uh, you know, <laughs> But they're kind of boring, um, although some of my colleagues would not say so because they've written lots of papers about them. Then coming back to the one I said I'd come back to, this is the S0 or lenticular galaxy. So lenticular, I think, is Latin for lens shape. So they look a bit like lens. And they're a bit easier to understand now we've talked about the other two. So these are really spiral galaxies that are no longer spiral. You can't see the spiral arms in them, but they still have that flatness and the uh, orderly rotation to them, but they're not making new stars anymore. You can see this is really quite red. Uh, and indeed this, these s zeros and the ellipticals are often called red and dead galaxies because they're not making new stars. They, they're just, uh, if I just flip back to the, the previous one, you can see how red it is. There's uh, very little star formation happening in there. They're just sort of drifting along uh, and will eventually uh, fizzle out, but you know, not for billions and billions of years yet. Uh, this is another S0. You can sort of see there was perhaps some structure there once, but uh, there isn't really anymore. It's just this sort of flat disky shape. Then the final one is the irregular galaxies. And these are usually in the middle of doing something. So this is M82, another nearby galaxy. Uh, if you look at it visually, you would just see this part of it. Um, it's called the Cigar Galaxy, I believe. But if we look in other uh, wavelengths, you can see there's a lot going on here. So it's very disrupted. So it's like a sort of train wreck. Something is going on. Lots and lots of stars being made at the moment, though. But that's probably because something has run into it or it's uh, having an explosive outburst. So whereas the Milky Way might be making a star a year, this is making maybe... Uh, 100, 400, 500 stars a, uh, a year. So going through a very rapid burst of uh, formation. Then we get dwarf irregulars. These are little galaxies that often uh, circle around other galaxies, such as the Magellanic clouds that circle around and uh, the Milky Way, which unfortunately we can only see from the Southern Hemisphere, but because they're already being pulled and shoved and pushed by the Milky Way, they never really tend to settle into a uh, any structure of its own. 
So with that, you've almost got everything you need to uh, get through our second year exam on galaxies, if uh, should you wish to. There is a little bit more maths involved than this, but um, you, you've got the basics now. So we thought we got everything uh, settled with uh, galaxies and we kind of knew everything about them and they fitted in nicely into this uh, structure that Edwin Hubble had got. But then we started finding something a bit odd. And uh, in fact, this is one of them. This is a Seyfert galaxy, M106. And they were discovered by Carl Seyfert in about the 1940s. And he was looking at a number of galaxies, looking at how much light they're putting out. And he noticed that these particular galaxies were putting out a lot of light from their center, the very center of the galaxy, much more than most of the other galaxies he'd looked at, you know, many times more. So he said, that's, that's a little strange. And he collected about four or five examples of this, published a paper on it, and they've now been called Seyfert galaxies or active galaxies. But they turned out to be a class of galaxy. So there is um, uh, a Seyfert type one and a Seyfert type two, and even a Seyfert one and a half. And then uh, as we got better at looking at the night sky in uh, other wavelengths, this uh, Hercules A here is a, another active galaxy. But if you can look at it as not just in the light, in the, the optical region, but also in radio waves, you can see that uh, there is definitely something going on. This galaxy is very, very active. It is shooting out stuff into uh, outer space at a prodigious rate. Uh, if, if you remember back, uh, I said it was about 100,000 light years from one side of the galaxy to the other. So it would take you 100,000 years to get from here to here. This has been shooting stuff out at a prodigious rate for many, many years to, to get this far out. And uh, it really has to be something very powerful to shoot it against all that gravity of all the stars within the galaxy, trying to pull it back in. So uh, that was a bit of a surprise. Uh, here's another one. This is a uh, Centaurus A. You can again see this sort of uh, outpouring of stuff from a, a more spiral galaxy in this case, shooting out, making this shock wave as it hits the intergalactic medium. Then we found other things. These are quasars thought they were stars originally, because this is what they look like, very sort of star-like. But actually, uh, in this one from the Hubble, they've masked out the star, and you can actually see there's a fuzzy galaxy behind it. So quasars are just very, very bright, active galaxies where the center of it really just dominates everything. Then there are other types. We, we keep finding new and others. This is a blazar or a BL lac. There is a slight difference between a blazar and a BL lac, but I've long forgotten what it is. Um, so there's quasars, blazars, there's safer type one, safer type two, there's a radio, narrow lined radio emission galaxies and so on. All, all types of the same thing, basically, as it turns out, because they're all explained by the same phenomenon, which is that there's a very, very large black hole at the center of every galaxy that we've looked at in enough detail to actually uh, explore that part of it. So it appears that this is what's causing those active galaxies to go active. They tend to be in one of two phases. Either they are what we call feeding, where they're consuming stuff and uh, um, you get this explosive outflows from them, or they're quiescent, like, like it is in the Milky Way, where it's just sitting there doing nothing. And these weigh from anywhere from a, a million solar masses to a billion solar masses. And uh, we, we saw a picture of a black hole about a couple of years ago by the Event Horizon Telescope. It's not actually the black hole, it's the shadow of the black hole, because black holes are black. Uh, but this is a, a sort of diagram of what's happening. There is the black hole right at the centre, this black bit. There is around it a disk of material that's, in this case, um, spiralling very, very fast, getting up to almost the speed of light as it spins around faster and faster. And uh, there's a lot of friction and a lot of energy there, and some of it gets loosed out either as a jet here shooting out. These tend to last for a few million years if, if they do have a jet, or sometimes they don't have a jet. Uh, if they do have a jet, they tend to be uh, symmetric, so there'll be a jet in both directions. Uh, and then there's a much bigger disk of material sort of orbiting at a much safer distance. So, and this can explain nearly all the black, uh, nearly all the active galaxies. So this was a Seyfert type one, the original Seyfert saw, 
and he was looking at it at this angle, so he could almost see down to the black hole. The black hole's far too small to see uh, in any telescope, but you can see the effects of it, so he could see right into that. The safer type two was looking at it at this angle, and you can't see past all this orbiting material that's way out here. And then uh, this is a quasar looking almost at the jet of the uh, black hole, and this is a blazar that's looking straight down the jet. So you can sort of explain most of these things by just the angle they happen to be um, positioned on the sky, whether you're looking straight into them or at an angle. So that's another one we ticked off. We sort of understood all those. Uh, then there are other things that happen. Uh, we get uh, the occasional collision between galaxies. And this is where the giggy years really uh, come in because they take such a long time to collide. It would be like watching a car crash in a very, very slow motion. So we can't actually see them crashing into each other. Not even PhD students will stick around long enough to um, watch one of these things because it takes about a billion years. But uh, if you look around the night sky long enough, you can see um, versions of this. So here's one that's uh, midway between collisions, start, just starting a collision. You can see bridges of stars have uh, started to form between the two. And if we came back in a, a billion years, we'd see something uh, more exciting. This is another one, the Antenna Galaxy. This is much further along. So here's the original galaxy, and this is one that's coming crashing into it. You can see a big burst of star formation up here, lots of blue stars being formed as everything is jumbled up and um, all, all the gases churned around and uh, made ready to make new stars. So we can sort of look at those things, but I'll, I'll show you later a, a better way to look at these. Then there's a whole lot of oddities, lots of strange things that I didn't really know what to uh, collect them together. So I just thought I'd put them together as oddities. So we have the very largest galaxy, which is not this one. This is just a spiral galaxy for scale. But if we shrink it down to about this size, this is the biggest galaxy with a catchy name of IC 1101. Uh, it's a big uh, elliptical galaxy. Uh, so the elliptical galaxies tend to be bigger than spiral galaxies. Uh, this is the Darth Vader galaxy, uh, or at least a reasonable facsimile, because it looks a bit like Darth Vader's spaceship. And we've got a lightsaber galaxy, uh, which is uh, unfortunately only visible in infrared. You, you don't see the lightsaber effect uh, in visible light. This is the very furthest galaxy we've uh, so far nailed down at a redshift of 11 or 13.4 billion light years away. The edge of the galaxy, uh, sorry, the edge of the universe is about 13.8 billion light years. So this is a very, very early galaxy. Uh, they are particularly difficult to uh, pin down because you don't get a lot of light out of all these things, as you might imagine. Uh, there's a ring galaxy. We're not really sure how you make one of those, um, but there's only a very few of those things around. Seems like a, a probably a collision of some sort that gets that. Another thing we toss around is a BCG, brightest cluster galaxy. Uh, we're a bit odd where we live. There's only two big galaxies where we are ourselves in Andromeda, but a lot of galaxies form in big clusters. And when there's a big cluster, there's a brightest one that dominates it right in the center. So this is the BCG, tends to eat other galaxies that come too close to it. And then perhaps my favorite word in uh, all galaxy uh, is the lurgs, the U lurgs and the E lurgs. Well worth dropping into a conversation if you can do it. So uh, these stand for luminous infrared galaxies because we are very bad at making up descriptive names or we perhaps run out of adjectives or something. So this is a very luminous galaxy, but only in the infrared. If you look at an invisible light, it's um, very drab. But if you look at it with an infrared telescope, it is extremely bright in the infrared. So we have this group of galaxies we call luminous infrared galaxies or LURGs for short. But after a while, we found another group of these things which were much, much brighter. So uh, we have the ULURG or the ultra luminous infrared galaxy. And then uh, the same thing happened again. Uh, we found some even brighter ones. And these are the ELURGs or extremely luminous infrared galaxies. And we've kind of stopped there because we haven't found anything brighter. Uh, we've also kind of run out of adjectives to um, stick on the front of it, uh, at least clean ones anyway. So uh, 
these things are really very dusty galaxies. Uh, if you think back to the Sombrero galaxy I showed you early on where, with these big dust lanes in it, these generate a lot of dust, which blocks out a lot of the light, so that the light gets soaked up by this dust and stops it getting out of the galaxy. But you can't destroy energy, so the dust grains get hotter and hotter, and eventually they will uh, give off their heat as uh, infrared light, and that's why they are so uh, luminous in this. Now, to the sort of area that I've worked in, simulations, uh, we don't need to be good. Uh, we, we can just simulate it, okay? So half the astronomers in our department use things like this, very big telescopes. Uh, other groups do this sort of thing each day, um, do lots of uh, deep maths to try and work out what's going on. And I go to uh, large computers and uh, run models on that. And they're quite simple to run, really, because uh, it's a very simple equation. It's just Newton's laws of gravity, which is this simple equation here. The force between any two things due to gravity is just given by this thing. This is if you're looking at between this thing and this thing. This would be m1, the mass of this one. This would be m2, the mass of that. And r, r would be the distance between them. And you have to square that. And g is just a constant. It's just a number. So it's quite a very simple equation to solve, uh, except when you're doing simulations, you have to solve billions of these at uh, any one time. So that, that gets a bit hard. So uh, that's where we go to supercomputers to solve all those equations for us. And we're helped out by the fact that the universe consists of this uh, these days. This is the stuff we understand, uh, the yellow and blue here, that's regular atoms. Dark matter makes up 27% of the universe, but um, we don't really know what it is. But we've got a reasonable idea how it works. Dark energy, we've got no idea how that, that uh, what that is or what it does really. But it does make up a lot of the uh, universe. Luckily, it doesn't have much effect on uh, simulations. And in the sort of work I'm trying to do, this is what we're trying to simulate. This is a picture of the universe from us standing on Earth in the Milky Way, right at the center here and looking out. And uh, we just put in this picture a dot for every galaxy we can see at the distance it is. And we weren't sure originally what we were going to see. Would it just be sort of random dots or would it be um, uh, in lines or, or what? But anyway, this is what we find. It has a certain amount of structure to it. We have these holes here where there doesn't seem to be any galaxies. And we sometimes get these long filament structures where there's lots of chains of galaxies. So that's what we can see. Uh, this is looking above the Milky Way and below the Milky Way. This is looking probably into the center. So it's very difficult to see past all the stars and likewise outwards. So this, these are the two easy ways. So we can put that into a computer and run it uh, like this. This is a um, simulation I ran on um, supercomputer. So this is a, a two-dimensional view of the universe, and this is a three-dimensional view that I'm just spinning around and uh, letting it coalesce after the Big Bang. And where it gets sort of more yellowy uh, or lighter blue is where there's a, a, a density of forming. So you can see places like this, this is a big knot of galaxies forming, a big cluster of uh, galaxies forming there. And it takes about 24 hours to uh, uh, run this sort of simulation. It's not a very detailed simulation, but it is, it's 125 uh, uh, gigaparsecs. Uh, I should have said, yes, when we went, when we talk about kiloparsecs, kilopar the uh, uh, Milky Way is about 30 kiloparsecs across. When you go to the next level, which is a gigaparsec, that's about the distance between galaxies. So one, about one gigaparsec will get you to the next group of galaxies. Anyway, if you let that run and you come up with this scenario, this is where there's this big cluster of galaxies, maybe a hundred galaxies all orbiting each other here. Out here somewhere is where we are in a very uh, sort of backwater part of the universe where there's not many galaxies. And how are we doing with simulators? We're doing pretty well at this level. So the stuff in blue is real data gathered from the night sky with uh, lots of telescopes and lots of work. And the stuff in red is a simulation. Uh, this was run back in about 2006 called the Millennium Simulation. But you can see here we have these structures like this big wall of galaxies here called the Great Sloan Wall. And we get something very similar in the Millennium Simulation. 
we get uh, big voids here, we get big voids over there. But if you compare them statistically, they're almost identical. One other simulation uh, is this one, which I think was done by somebody from NASA or at least employed by NASA. So this is a simulation of our backyard. This is supposed to be the Milky Way, um, our best effort at describing it. Uh, and uh, these are the other major things within us. So we have Andromeda, which is similar sort of size to the Milky Way and Triangulum, which is quite a lot smaller. But in about 4 billion years, these two uh, huge structures will collide with each other. They're going to towards each other at a prodigious rate. And there we go, at about 4 billion years, they will crash into each other. Very unlikely that any two stars will actually collide because they're just so far apart. If you remember back to these uh, two marbles, many hundreds of miles apart. But what you can see here is what started off as two beautiful spiral galaxies is now a complete mess and looking very much like an elliptical galaxy at this point. Um, they will have lost a lot of their gas that would be used to make new stars, so they're going to settle down into this red and dead phase. Uh, so that is probably one way these galaxies evolve. Now in just the last few minutes, I thought I'd go through some open questions that we still need to research, which is why it's still worth funding people to do research in astronomy. Um, first problem is we don't, you know, I said every galaxy has one of these supermassive black holes at the center of it. We have no idea how you make one of those. At least we have no idea how you make one of those in the short time that they're required to be made. Uh, there are a few crazy theories out there, but nothing that everybody uh, is willing to accept at this point. So that's an ongoing question. How do you make a supermassive black hole? Nobody knows. Another question is uh, something that we do quite a lot of research at Nottingham with is if you look at all the galaxies and you just plot them on a simple graph of uh, how heavy they are. So these are lighter and these are heavier and the color, these are bluer and these are redder. They naturally form into two clumps. The red sequence, which is mostly elliptical galaxies and the blue cloud, which is mostly spiral galaxies. And we think just based on that Andromeda egg, example that uh, these things will become those things at some point. Blues will move into red. But red galaxies tend to be a lot heavier, maybe 10 times uh, even more heavier than blue galaxies. So do they put on weight like some of us will do over Christmas and then turn red? Or do they turn red and then put on weight? We're not really sure. And so we, we do quite a lot of time looking for galaxies that fall in between, called the Green Valley because it's between the blue and red, and see if we can work out uh, what's going on there. And to use that, we have various tools. We have um, something that's been very productive is the Gaia satellite, which has mapped the Milky Way to a prodigious um, degree. This gives us very good uh, data on how spiral galaxies work because we can see all the stars moving in that. Fingers crossed, uh, 22nd of December, the James Webb Space Telescope will be launched and this will give us a much better view of the universe because it's a much bigger mirror than Hubble and a much more capable machine. But uh, you have to keep your fingers crossed for that. We've also got a very big radio telescope array coming online. This is in uh, this is the square kilometre array in South Africa and Western Australia. And we've also got some prodigious uh, next generation telescopes coming along. This is the ELT, the Extremely Large Telescope, because I said we're really bad at describing things. These are the VLTs, these are currently working. These are the very large telescopes. So these are eight meter mirrors. This is a 39 meter mirror. So uh, you certainly need planning permission if you're gonna put that in a shed in your garden, 39 meters. That's um, like half, half a football pitch. And it would look like this. Uh, it's being built in Chile and they're up to about this level now though up to about this level here and uh, making some of the mirrors and what does a 39 meter mirror look like it looks something like that so uh, needs considerable polishing you'll need a couple of bottles of windex or something to uh, uh, keep that one clean so to conclude galaxies are really big i said about 400 billion stars in each most of them stars have planets so lots and lots of room for expansion we're still researching how galaxies are formed, uh, how they live and die. And 
we're looking forward to the next set of telescopes, which will really help us answer some of these questions and without a doubt, give us lots more. So with that, thank you very much for listening. And I hope you found some of that interesting. And uh, back to you, Peter, I think. Thank you, Julian. Well, you've given us a lot to think about there. And you promised us lots of pretty pictures. <laughs> we, we certainly had them. Julian, uh, now is the time for questions. And I'm going to do what I very often do and abuse my position as chair of the meeting to ask the first question. And that is that I'm always uh, uh, staggered by the fact that you can deduce the shape of the Milky Way. Every other galaxy, you can turn your telescope on it and you can see it from at least one angle. It may not be the best angle, but you get an angle on it. But the Milky Way, you showed us a picture of the Milky Way with all the spiral arms and so on. But I'm in, I'm in awe that sitting here in the middle of it, you can find that out. You, you showed us Herschel's picture. And here we are. And if, you, if we look up in the sky, we see a massive great streak, if it's a dark enough sky, across the sky, and that's the Milky Way. But how you astronomers can deduce from that all these spiral arms, I'm, like I say, I'm in awe, and I don't know whether you can explain that to me in a short time or not. Uh, it, it's certainly not been easy, and it's taken many years to, to get to where we are. But I guess the key is measuring the distance to the stars. Once you can do that, then you can sort of uh, plot them on a, on a diagram. You say this one's this far away and this one's that far away. And you can start looking at uh, that. So that's been a very slow process for many years, but it's speeded up over the last 20 or 30 when um, things like uh, originally Hipparchos uh, was a satellite that uh, measured distances to, ooh, I don't know, a few million stars or something like that. And now Gaia is doing it for a few billion stars. So we're getting a very good map of the Milky Way now. Uh, it's still tricky because some areas you can see uh, for miles basically and some you, you have these dark nebulas which you can't see beyond so you have to turn to infrared astronomy which can look through those so it's a question of sort of filling in all these gaps and trying to to work out your your best picture of it uh, but it does take a lot of work thanks julian that was a, an amazing talk that's reflected in a a lot of the comments in the chat box, how much everybody enjoyed it and how fascinating it was. Um, first real question uh, from Anthony. Uh, when you're running your simulations uh, of, the, of the galaxies interacting, he's wondering, have you ever done a multi-galaxy collision? Um, well, we, we don't usually run it to sort of crash galaxies into each other uh, on demand. We usually run just big, big boxes and then look at the results. Uh, but we have, um, somebody did do analysis of a, a fairly big simulation that uh, was run and uh, looked at, you know, mo most collisions were just two things, but he did find, I think a handful of three, three galaxy collisions and even a, I think up to in one case, six galaxies. Although I believe two of them were quite big and then you've got a lot of sort of small things also crashing into each other. So. Uh, uh, they, they have been seen. Um, they're a lot harder to see out in the wild, obviously, in, in the night sky, because uh, it's a lot more messy there. Good question, though. Thank you very much for that one. OK. Um, next question is from Ted. Uh, when was the last time the Milky Way Centre was active? And in, quote, in uh, it says Fermi bubbles. I have to admit, I know nothing about Fermi bubbles. Oh, so another good question there from Ted. Yeah. So we, I don't know exactly when it was last active, but as he said, these Fermi bubbles, which is if we look at the um, Milky Way in gamma ray, which is the, the most energetic uh, part of the electromagnetic spectrum, very sort of deadly rays, uh, but you can see above and below the core of the Milky Way, these big um, gamma ray if, um, regions, which are called Fermi bubbles. And that is thought to possibly be the, uh, 
the remnants of when it was more active. Uh, at the moment, the black hole at the centre of the Milky Way seems to have eaten everything going that's uh, gone past it. There was a lot of excitement a couple of years ago when we thought there was a big gas cloud going to go very close to it and we might see a big flare up, but um, actually it just went past it and uh, uh, nothing much happened. So uh, that was a bit of a damp squib, that one. But uh, yeah, good question. I, I don't know the answer to it exactly. But uh, it seems it has been active in the past. Okay. Um, Colin was wondering, given that the further a telescope sees, the further back into the past it sees, does that mean that in principle it's possible to see the Big Bang itself or whatever came before it? Oh, another good question. Um, so nearly. <laughs> We're kind of restricted. Uh, you can keep pushing backwards and backwards. Uh, it doesn't really, it's not very useful with optical telescopes. You can go back to when the first galaxies and stars formed. Uh, but before that, it was what's called the dark ages. There were no stars there to see. So there was, it, was, it was all dark. Uh, if you keep going back at 380,000 years after the Big Bang is called uh, the Epoch of Reionization. And that is as far back as we'll ever be able to see with any form of light because uh, that was when the universe was too hot and uh, all the electrons were uh, freed from their atoms and they were just floating around independently and they tend to absorb light. So light can never get very far. It just goes a little way and then runs into an electron. And, uh, so it would be in a very cloudy universe for the first 380,000 years. So that's about as far as we can look back. That is the cosmic microwave background. If you've heard of that, that comes from that event. Beyond that, you could theoretically look further back if you went to something else. So gravity waves, um, but you need something like the LISA experiment to, to look back that far. Or neutrinos were, would also pass through that barrier. But um, neutrinos are really, really difficult to detect. So uh, we don't think that's uh, uh, an option for a long time to come. So yeah, you, you, you'd go back to about the, the first stars is about as far back as you can see with the telescope. Okay. Um, Pat, Punch was just wondering about what is the definition of the universe and does it include galaxies? Oh, that's a very insightful question, that is. Uh, so we often talk about the visible universe, which is that bit we can see. We suspect the universe is actually much bigger than we can see, but because of the speed of light, we can't see beyond it. So it would be a bit like sitting on a boat in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. You could see out to the horizon and you suspect there is more water beyond you that it doesn't just finish there, but you, you've no way of uh, finding out. And it's kind of like that. We think the universe goes on much further than we can see it, but uh, because light is the fastest thing moving at the moment, um, that's as far as we can see. And we suspect it's look much like our current universe that we can see just more of it, a bit like sitting in the Pacific Ocean. Okay. Um, interesting question from, from Jeffrey. Uh, fabulous talk, but uh, there's always a but. <laughs> <laughs> what basic information goes into the simulation and where does it all come from? And how good are your simulations and how do you know? Uh, and finally, I didn't see any sign of the expanding universe in your simulation. Okay, uh, right, let's take those one yeah. by one. So the basic information that goes into the simulation comes from this cosmic microwave background. So that's, that's in the microwave. And what that tells us is sort of how lumpy the universe was at 380,000 years. So, you know, was it was the lumps of matter here, here and here, or was it all spread out? Uh, it tends to be sort of vaguely lumpy at that point, but we, we can work out from that signal exactly how, uh, uh, what the density of various parts of it, and we can put that into our model. So that's how we start the model rolling. We say it, it, it's approximately what the cosmic microwave background is telling us. And if we put that in and just let it run, what happens? So that, that's how we start with that. How good are the simulations? Well, that's a, that's a sort of fighting talk almost in that they can be as good or as bad as, as you wish. Uh, 
some of it depends on the physics that you put into it, how well you simulate it. It's very easy to do dark matter simulations because not a lot happens in them. Once you start putting real atoms into it, it gets a lot more complicated. And there are endless arguments on how good those simulations are. But the other things that go into it is if you want to simulate it, how many of these particles do you put into your universe? The more you put in and the lighter they are, the better your model will be, but the more computing power it takes. So the current sort of records are up to about a trillion of these particles you put in early on and let it evolve. Uh, but that needs a really large supercomputer. And if you're going with atoms in it, probably takes three or four months to run on even the biggest supercomputer. And finally, did not see any sign of the expanding universe. Well, that's because we kind of take it out. Um, we run in what's called an expanding box. So the box starts off at a certain size and it grows with the expansion of the universe. Uh, but um, for ease of seeing things, we keep the, the actual projected box the same size. So uh, we, we've taken that out basically of, um, it, it, it's really there, but uh, we, we've subtracted it from uh, what we show because it just gets in the way quite a lot of the time. If, if you've got all these things happening, uh, it's it's a bit more difficult to visualize, but it, it's actually there. Okay. Um, final question from me uh, before I hand over to Paul. Uh, Terry Mosley is wondering, given the size of the DM halos, I assume that's dark matter, are the DM halos of the Milky Way and M31 already colli colliding? If so, could we detect it? Well, that's a good question. I suspect they are probably overlapping uh, at this point because they, they are quite large and there isn't really a hard boundary to it. It's a bit like a galaxy. You, you get less and less stars and eventually you kind of say, well, that's probably the end of it. But if we found another star beyond it, well, you know, that it would be a bit further. So the dark matter does sort of fade out slowly and same from Andromeda and they, they will eventually tangle. But at the, at the very limits of where they, they would be touching, there wouldn't be a lot of dark matter. And dark matter is very, very bad at interacting with anything at all. So it doesn't even bump into itself. It just sort of passes through itself nearly all the time. Uh, so the chances of seeing actually anything from those dark matter halos colliding would be very limited at this stage. You'd, you'd need to thicken up the amount of dark matter and collide them much faster to even get a chance of that happening. I mean, they, they do a lot of dark matter detection or attempt to do it on, on the earth where they, they wait for it to come through dark matter detectors. And although there are probably billions and billions of dark matter particles, whatever they are coming through these detectors, they suspect they will only find one a month because they are so rare, these interactions. And so, yeah, to cut a long story short, so far they found none. So uh, make of that what you will. Hi, Julian. Thanks for the great talk. Really enjoyed it. Philip McCahey has a bit of a long one here. I'm just going to read it out. Your very interesting talk, which highlighted the fact that between dark matter and dark energy, it amounts to 95% of unknown. Could it mean that such a small amount of known data and any deductions would not be dependable? Rather like the famous picture of five blind men describing the shape of an elephant individually, which they were all incorrect. Yeah, that's that's a very good point and uh, somewhat of an embarrassment to uh, astronomers in general that we've been studying 5% of the universe for most of history. And then it suddenly turned out there's sort of 95% more to look at that uh, we didn't even know was there. So we've known about dark matter since about 1980s. Uh, we've been reasonably sure there was something else around there. Dark energy was a bit of a surprise in about the late 1990s. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, it's all been a bit embarrassing. But um, the measurements of the amount of each of them, the best measurements come from uh, the Planck satellite, which studies the cosmic microwave background. And that has fairly good constraints on the amount of each of these things. So we think we're fairly sure about the relative amounts of it. You know, it could be 68% dark mass of dark energy or maybe 69%, but it's around that amount. And for dark matter, it's about five to one. For every particle of regular matter, there's about five of uh, dark matter or, or five times the weight at least. And 
we have evidence from a number of lines of experimentation that that ratio seems to be right. You know, it's not just one, one person doing this or one experiment. There's five or six strands that all seem to point in that same direction. So we'd be fairly surprised at this point um, if we were caught out. But we've been caught out before, so uh, you could well be right that it, it, it does turn out to be an elephant or maybe a turtle or something like that that uh, we're trying to describe. Uh, Terry Mosley is back with another question, which is why are the H2 regions in the image of the Whirlpool galaxy so prominent? I don't know exactly to that one. It could well be the wavelength they're taken in. Uh, sometimes these, these are um, combined images, so both the optical and infrared. And uh, for H2, you probably want radio wave uh, overlays as well. So, so sometimes it's just just that. I mean, I, I went and picked the prettiest pictures I could find of the, these galaxies. Uh, I should go back and have a look at uh, the source to, to be sure of that. But uh, yeah, they, they, these galaxies are often photographed for particular uh, reasons. You know, so they might be looking at the H2 regions, which uh, would be a good source of uh, gas for star formation. So that, that might be why this was originally taken. And then somebody has said, oh, that'll make a nice picture. Uh, let's, let's go and uh, tweak it up and make it uh, pretty. Uh, Michael Gose asks, are any of the galaxies moving or at or near the speed of light? The really, really distant ones are because of the expansion of the universe, which gets, uh, you know, gets uh, cumulative as you go towards the edge. Uh, in fact, the ones at the very edge of visibility are almost um, certainly gone over that uh, speed of light boundary by now. But we're seeing the light that set off, you know, 13 billion years ago that's now arrived at us. But if we were to sort of look instantaneously, it, it would be going much faster than speed of light now. So, yeah, some of them are kind of dropping off the horizon as we speak. Ian asks, what is the cause of the bright area at the core of the galaxies? So this, this can be two things, either that um, the, the core of most of the spiral galaxies tends to be a bit like an elliptical galaxy. So it's a big collection of old stars, uh, but it's in a sort of more um, football shaped at the center. So that's why you get this big bulge. So you, you get quite a lot more stars there. And, uh, you know, that looks a bit brighter. And they're also a bit closer packed. So that's one reason. The other is if it's an active galaxy, then it's the this black hole that's devouring stuff and lighting up uh, all and sundry around there. So either of those explanations, depending on exactly what sort of galaxy it is. And since there's no more questions, I'm going to ask one. And that is, did you see Professor Brian Cox's documentary on the universe recently? I did. Yes. Yeah. It's, did he it's, did you find it interesting that he kind of was saying that uh, there was already two galaxies already after crashing into the Milky Way so far? Oh, oh, yes, yes. Um, yeah, so there's the Sagittarius galaxy. That's, uh, there's, there's been evidence of lots of collisions. And uh, in our simulations, we see them all the time. That's the, probably the main reason galaxies grow is that they sort of absorb smaller ones. The Magellanic clouds, the small and large, they are doomed within about a billion years. The Milky Way will consume those two. And you, if you look, uh, I think Brian Cox had that. You can actually see trails of stars going through the Milky Way, which is a sort of a fossil re remnant called galactoarchaeology. Uh, it's, it's a particular thing where you, you look at the galaxy and try and work out what happened billions of years ago. So, yeah, our. Uh, our Milky Way has quite an appetite, but uh, it can eat quite a number of these small dwarf galaxies and not really notice it. Uh, but when it comes to something about its own size, you know, like you know, if, if you pick on uh, someone much smaller in a fight, uh, you, you'll probably win. But if you pick on someone slightly larger, you're probably going to come off. Um, you probably both going to come off badly. And that's what's going to happen with the Andromeda galaxy. We're, we're both going to end in a mess from that one. Julian, well, Cork Astronomy Club is honoured that you've joined our meeting tonight. You gave us a marvellous guided tour of the galaxies in the universe, provided us some marvellous pictures, and uh, we got one insight into your makeup, and that is you appear to be um, extraordinarily keen on chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
thank you very much and thank you for inviting me to give talk uh, it's my, been my pleasure thank you julian